Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone online and everyone that are here in the auditorium. Uh, great to meet you. And uh, looking forward to uh, a really a fun session today. Um, <clears throat> one thing you should know about my style is I really don't mind being interrupted by you. I would really much rather have you put up your hand, ask a question, and we have a dialogue rather than just me doing a didactic presentation to you over an hour and having you fall asleep. Although I don't think you will fall asleep because we're going to talk about some really interesting stuff today. And uh, thrilled to be here in person. Last time, I think Ahmed mentioned I was here in 2019, and since then, it's been all virtual. So uh, it, it feels good to be here. I don't like the traffic driving here, but uh, I really much prefer to be here in person to be able to meet all of you, see your faces, and have a good conversation. And same with you online. So. Uh, let me just, uh, ad how do we advance the screen here? Um, I have to get used to all the technology again. Okay, there we go. Thank you. All right, so we're going to cover this in three parts today. Part one, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the marketplace, what happened during COVID, and what is the health of the medical device marketplace and the technology marketplace today, particularly if we're going to talk about business modeling. Uh, in this environment. So we'll do that for part one. Part two, we'll talk about different types of business models um, that are utilized in the medical technology space and how innovators can best articulate and illustrate these models. And um, we'll talk about how financials kind of fit into the context of business modeling as well. Um, it's important. You have to do it. And then in part three, we're going to just do a small workshop. It's going to be a really simple and fun workshop where you get to build your own business model uh, canvas. So here's the agenda. We're already a little bit behind, and this is going to be tight. So I'm going to go at a pretty good pace today. But if I'm going too fast, just put up your hand or just holler just and, and ask me to go through something a little, uh, again if we have to. And uh, then we'll take a break and we'll go into the workshops. I've structured these workshops also so I can rob a few minutes from them. So um, we're a little bit flexible with our timing today. But we're going to spend just over an hour on the seminar and then just over an hour and a half on the, on the workshop. So let's start just with the market trends and um, the uh, current VC uh, environment. So uh, what we see here is a slide showing how the um, how the equity markets fell across almost every major jurisdiction uh, in uh, globally. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see the Nasdaq. Um, thank you, Ahmed. You can see how Nasdaq had one of the most substantial falls in 2000. 22 after the, the pandemic. So the markets finally caught up to the pandemic. NASDAQ took a huge hit, and that's the home of a lot of medical device and biopharmaceutical companies. Um, in regards to global venture capital investment, I mean, it reached a record high in 2021. That's what you see here in the yellow bar. And then following 2021, we saw a major crash that you can see on the right hand side and that crash that was not only sustained but it even went lower than what you see here for the rest of 2022 and 2023. The global venture capital investments dropped, uh, venture capital investments in the Americas fell and exit values of a lot of early stage companies fell as well. So there was a massive hit on the marketplace that was caused by the COVID environment. If you take a look a little bit more closely, though, at the biotechnology sector, and if you follow the red line in the graph, that red line uh, is the Standard & Poor Index for biotech companies. You can see that the fall actually started in the biotech sector a year earlier in January, and then the rest of the markets just caught up in 2022 as part of the uh, COVID impact. There were winners and losers at this time. Some of the winners were those companies that are developing technology tools and software for increased efficiency or for hospitals, lab companies, and managed care industry, all as a result of COVID-19. So those servicing COVID-19 issues, 
they hit the uh, the jackpot, right? And then those companies that um, did not, like home health companies and primary care providers, they were negatively impacted and quite substantially. Returns in pharma were strong, but that's artificial. That was largely inflated by Pfizer, Eli Lilly, and J&J because they were um, making huge gains with uh, COVID-19, right, and, and their vaccines. But if you look at the rest of the market, it didn't perform very well. It took a big hit. Medical devices and supply companies, they were dispersed. Some did well. Those that were servicing those COVID-19 needs that we had, they did great. The others didn't do great because there was a freeze on capital expenses and uh, it was a very difficult environment. And then finally, the biotech industry, they experienced the greatest weakness. Um, they had lackluster clinical progress outside of COVID-19. There was regulatory scrutiny, clinical safety setbacks in areas such as gene therapy. So overall, um, it was a very, very difficult year. And we, we talk about biopharma because it has a huge impact on these exchanges, and that in turn also impacts the medical device industry. So it's important not to ignore how the biopharma dragged down the medical device industry as well. Uh, the environment got tougher to raise money. That's, and we're going to talk about the importance of business modeling um, in this environment. Uh, but it was real. Um, global venture funding for startups, it, I mean, it fell substantially. And the number of deals that were made to support early stage companies fell um, as well. And it was projected that the recovery would take time. And they were right. So what this is, is um, it's called an XBI tracked standard and poor biotech select industry total return index. And it shows these colored lines and the color of the line shows an assessment of the degree to which investors felt they were either in a downturn, red, or coming out of the downturn, yellow, and finally out of the woods, green. And back in 2021, you could see that there was no yellow, there was no green. And then if we were to look at this index today, you'll see that uh, it fell even further and we remain more or less flat. And what we're hoping for is a strong turnaround, hoping we start seeing some signs later this quarter or early next year. Okay, why? Why is all of this happening? Well, we've read about it, and we know a lot about the major drivers that cause these trends. One is there is global instability. Um, we're facing rising interest rates, interest rates that um, I know many of you have not seen in your lifetime. I don't recall these interest rates until the uh, uh, since the 80s. Um, and rising inflation rates. The cost of doing business is much higher today. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that we uh, also had longer-term biotech and medtech challenges as well. The rate of clinical drug development failures remains a concern. Declining biotech returns and changing market making it tougher, not only for biopharmaceutical companies, but also for medical device companies as well. And we're going to take a closer look at that in the subsequent slides so you have a real good understanding of what these changes in the market are and why it's dragged down the market, how this has then impacted early stage companies and why it's important to really nail your, uh, your pitch presentations to your VCs to give you a shot at raising funds in this difficult environment. Because it also creates a great opportunity for you to differentiate yourself and be a, a, a leader of a pack. And uh, that's why we're doing this exercise, to position you to be able to achieve that. So um, building on uh, some of the trends in biopharma, we know it takes approximately up to 10 years to uh, develop uh, a drug, um, largely because of the amount of time that it takes to uh, implement phase one, two, and three clinical trial programs. But we also know that about one in 10 uh, or two in 10 products make it. So the cost of drug failure is extremely high. Um, 
And uh, drug development costs continue to rise. This is a report that was generated by Global Data showing the, uh, uh, the, the cost to bring drugs to the market rising year after year from 2015 to 2020, and the projected returns have been declining. This is a concern to VCs, and there's a lot of attention that's being put on this by biopharma companies to uh, make uh, drug development more efficient and less costly. Pharma is also facing major challenges with drug pricing and reimbursement in the United States. And every time there's a new policy that's put forward, the investors just cringe because it makes the, the market a little bit more unattractive compared to the market that we knew uh, in the years past. So particularly, pricing and reimbursement-related concerns remain the leading impediment to industry growth. I was able to get this report from IQVA. They're uh, a global leader in biopharmaceutical reimbursement. And they presented this slide about a year and a half ago. And there were some stats here that I never saw before. We're not used to this in the US. Starting from the left, in 2021, only one in four new to brand patients uh, who attempted to fill a launch brand was successful in doing so because of payer controls. Um, more than half of the brands missed their first year forecasts. Recent launch brands have as much as 40% chance of not reaching 10 million in the first year. I mean, these are staggering numbers compared to what we saw in the pharmaceutical industry in the past. And on the very right hand side, as many as 70% of patients in newly launched brands are supported by patient assistant programs because they just can't afford the costs of these medications. This is putting a lot of pressures on the marketplace. Um, so there are, and from this, or causing this, there are multiple drivers. We're seeing growing payer controls um, uh, that are challenging patient access. And these controls are increasing. Those red bars that you see on the left-hand side are the percentage of patients that can't get their medications paid for uh, at the launch of the product. And um, historically, uh, pharmaceutical companies used to raise their prices each and every year, uh, but now there are controls that are in place that are limiting how much you can increase your price on an annual basis. And there are new programs like the 340B drug discount program that are forcing companies to reduce their margins this went into legislation in about March of 2022, and it forces manufacturing companies to strike deals with Medicaid um, in the different jurisdictions around the US. All of these pressures we never saw before, but they're here now because there is a big push to control costs in the US market in particular. And, um, but that makes it a, a tougher place to, to play because it's a higher hurdle to achieve the profits that we used to be able to achieve. And as a result, these pressures are just putting a lot of pressure on the market and bringing the market down, and that's impacting the entire biotechnology sector. Question. Yeah, yeah, this pertains to the global market, but the U.S. is a major driver of that global market. And um, uh, the uh, so the context of this is global, but largely U.S. as well in the right of the global. Next question. Yeah, well, I'm not as familiar with that one, but there are a lot of problems. <laughs> That may be one of them. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you are. Uh, now, I don't know the nature of that very specific one, but I mean, an example is, uh, you know, you have generic companies that are out there and they're developing generic drugs and they're substantially cutting the prices and still making a profit as well. So the, um, and there's a lot of, uh, 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 companies that have developed a kind of generic spin-off companies so that they can still capitalize on the profits associated with a generic product in addition to their branded products that they sell. So just major, major, major changes that we're seeing in the U.S. They're trying to correct some major problems that we have, right, in the U.S. marketplace when it comes to costs, but this impacts profit and that impacts the performance of the market. 
Um, Price Waterhouse Cooper, I think, has really well summarized the market challenges in pharma. Drug makers are grappling with extended drug development timelines, price scrutiny, high costs of regulation and litigation, and increasing competition every, in nearly every category of the pharmaceutical marketplace. And um, gross margins for some new treatments, like the CAR T-cell treatments and cell therapies, uh, they're, uh, they're well below historical averages. And all of these forces need to be overcome in order to pursue higher shareholder returns. And uh, that was really nicely summarized. The medical device market is also facing major challenges as well. Shifting market dynamics, regulatory changes, healthcare transformation, value-based care, technology, uh, technological evolution. Um, a lot of these uh, changes um, are largely based on the concerns about healthcare costs. Um, hospitals, they're the major purchasers of medical technologies. They're under huge financial pressures in the United States. And, um, and uh, they're, 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 they're trying to find ways and how to cut costs. And Medicare and Medicaid, they tend to pay less than other payers. And uh, they're, they increase their payments over time on a very slow rate. So it's not a very attractive uh, payer mechanism. And many hospitals are consolidating. And they're using their purchasing power to drive harder bargains with the medical technology companies that are out there. So um, uh, there are, again, a lot of pressures. We now have what are called value committees that are driving major decisions about what technologies to buy. And they're basing a lot of those decisions on, on, um, on, on how do we put value in the technologies that are emerging right now and that are being sold to these institutions. And there are new regulations. So there's a, a new regulation that was started in 2021 in the U.S. where hospitals now have to publish the prices for various services that they provide before they held that very close to their chest. They didn't have to divulge it. But now by doing so, that might heighten the awareness of these costs and the interest to try lowering these costs and thereby putting even more pressure on uh, technology companies. Um, so the landscape, it's changing rapidly. Uh, there's new contracting thinking going on, new partnerships, new business models. We'll be talking about all of these new things that are happening right now. So you're at the forefront of this thinking and you're able to build in some of this thinking and ideas with the plans that you are developing. Um, we're seeing increasingly new payment arrangements. These are how organizations are being paid for their innovations. And there are more and more and more very unique strategic partners, um, even working with your fiercest competitor, perhaps, in finding ways to uh, what, what they call um, cooperate together. And uh, it's called, I think it's called coopetitive. Uh, so cooperate with, with, with the toughest competition. There are demands to demonstrate improved outcomes. Um, healthcare is becoming increasingly more decentralized in the U.S., so you're also negotiating with more and more players. So it puts a lot of challenges on your resourcing model that you would need to launch a, bl a, a, a brand globally, um, nevertheless, in the United States alone. And with other technology advancements, uh, with informed and active patient consumers and new telehealth reimbursement codes, it's sowing the seeds for a much more closely interconnected business environment. And for those organizations that are astute about all of these changes, you're well positioned to, nego to navigate and to succeed. And for those who don't, you're going to be lost. It's really important to pay attention to all these changes that are happening in the market. This is just a nice snapshot summarizing the major trends that are forcing new payment arrangements within business models, um, major market dynamics, technology advances like AI um, uh, and 3D robotics uh, and the internet of medical things and so much more. Um, care transformation, shifting from inpatient to outpatient, and shifting from treatment to prevention. 
there's the drive towards value-based care where they're bundling um, deals, uh, there's value purchasing, and there's changes in policy and regulatory requirements as well. So in this um, uh, environment, it's really important to demonstrate your value proposition as part of your overall business model. I like this slide by uh, Deloitte. They just summarize the characteristics that will likely enable technologies to have the greatest value proposition. So for those companies selling technology, that's in the blue, um, if you are targeting a large target population uh, with a high cost of condition or the original technologies were a high cost and you have an opportunity to take market share from those technologies uh, where you can demonstrate a significant impact on reducing cost or improving quality uh, measured within a year and demonstrate data available to measure impact, you are in a great position to demonstrate value. Um, if you're, if these characteristics don't apply, demonstrating value is just a little bit of a tougher job to do, but it's important to pay attention to these because if they apply to the products or services that you're developing, you're in a great position to have a strong value story as part of your overall uh, value proposition and business model. Okay, what was the impact of this, of these changes and this changing marketplace? And particularly, what was the impact of the COVID-19 downturn? And where I'm going to get at is how did this impact the VC and how they think and what they want to hear from you? And how does that play into business modeling? So we're going to connect all the dots now. So post COVID, uh, it was a reset for a lot of organizations, um, there were a lot of layoffs as well. Um, valuations were very closely examined at this time and there were some down rounds that occurred where your subsequent raise was a lower valuation than your previous raise. That hurts, but it happened and um, it still happens. Uh, biotech is taking longer to raise money and Crossover investors uh, are resetting their expectations. I'll get to that in a moment. So we saw term sheets being pulled. Um, crossovers are those investors who take a significant stake of your company with the intent of seeing your company through to an IPO. And uh, But we saw for the first time that there were some crossovers that were not willing to wait it out during the COVID crisis. They were not willing to take the risk and uh, we didn't see that that much before COVID, um, but that was one of the major change that we saw over the last three years. And um, clearly, the investors are now scrutinizing development plans more, um, and uh, they're, they're focusing on quality. Uh, this is a great article that I read that came out of the NASDAQ website, and it showed you there are three things that VCs need to know to navigate in this current economic environment. Um, getting ready for the talent stampede, that's because many companies didn't make it and there was a lot of talent that you could then place in other organizations. Uh, they're pacing their investments slower, taking longer, and they're putting a lot more attention to quality. Uh, so higher quality companies with real business models, that's what they're looking for. And, um, and they're increasingly focusing on what are called viable business models. That's where the attention is. It's not just there, but it's one of the top areas of focus. Um, so today's VC, this is what they're faced with. Major trade-off decisions, lowering risks, putting safer bets, higher attention to quality and differentiation, and examining faster gains. And um, so... When they are engaging with early stage companies, they want to take it also to a deeper dive. The quality of your science and data, the stage of your product readiness and IP protection, business model readiness and financials to go with it, milestones and traction and the right management team. If you can hit on these five bullets on the yellow bar, you're going to nail it with the VC and you will get that, uh, you will earn the right to have a, a good due diligence discussion probably almost all the time. But if you, for each one of these bullet points that you cannot 
put a check mark on, it diminishes the likelihood of you achieving any funding from any VC. Um, so it's critical. Now, we don't have the time today to go through all five of these items that you see here in the orange box, but we are going to focus on business model readiness and financials because it is critically important, and we can capture the other items at another time. Don't forget about the most common pitfalls of why organizations fail. Uh, these are two separate reports, but they're saying the same thing. And um, you can see some of the top reasons. If you look on the right-hand side, the top 20 reasons why startups fail, uh, the need or a lack of a business model falls in the top 10, as well as other critically important items, such as you ran out of cash, which is part of your financial management, um, and, and pricing and cost issues, which is also part of your financials as well. So financials and business modeling is critical. But the other themes that you need to pay attention to about why companies fail is summarized in the middle of this slide, right? Good smart cash flow and financial management, showing good clarity of your business model, your stage of your product readiness. Those companies that are working with a minimal viable product have a tougher time than those that are closer to what's called the final product. Um, having a good strong management team Many VCs put up to 60% of their decision making of whether they're going to fund a company or not on the management team. I didn't know if you all knew how high that was. It's not just about how good your product is. They have, they want to like you as well. They want to make sure that you're not going to screw it up. And so the management team is vital and your overall readiness to execute. And all of these items play into risk. So, um, how do you digest all of this? Uh, it's as follows. Number one is, uh, let's start on the bottom right. Make sure that you answer all these common pitfalls. So you got to address uh, these pitfalls in order to differentiate yourself. Ensure that you have clarity with your business model, that you have smart cash flow and financial management in your organization, that you're at a, uh, you have to uh, clearly articulate, articulate the stage of your product readiness and your path to a final product. Um, you got to have a, a strong management team and your organization has to be ready to execute. Again, if you put a check mark on all of these, you're going to do extremely well. If you can't, you have to find out a way to address this as a major issue. On the left hand side, building your financials and your team, that just reiterates what we said on the right. And on the top left, just confirm your value proposition. What is the benefit of your innovation to your target audience? It's critically important. And for those that can put all of this together, um, they generally do differentiate themselves extremely well in this marketplace, and they're better to position to raise the funds that they need in order to succeed as an organization. I'm going to skip the slide here. And uh, that's part one. That's the market. That's where we are today. Any questions about the market, medical devices or biopharma? Any comments? How about anyone online? All right. So I'm going to shift gears now. We'll go into business modeling. And... Um, and we're going to look at quite a few case studies to show a few examples of how companies are um, implementing various business models through partnerships and through unique uh, payer, payer mechanisms. All right. So what is a business model? Um, it's a structure, right? And it's a, it's a structure that's comprised of all aspects of a company and how they all work together. So it outlines, you know, how you plan to make money. And a good business model should answer these questions, right? What product or service a company will sell? How it intends to make the product or service? What are the distribution channels? What is the revenue model and what are the revenue streams? What kind of expenses the company will face, including cost of goods? and understanding the margins and when the company expects to turn a profit. This is actually a fraction of the questions. There are more. 
But um, I, I've seen many pitch presentations where the presenter might say, well, we're uh, our business model is looking at a, a it's a subscription model. Or, right, or we're selling widgets or units and here's the cost per unit. But where's the rest of the story? There's so much more. And again, by answering a lot of these questions, I think it puts you in a position to differentiate from other companies who are pitching to the same VC of putting a very smart, comprehensive story around your business model that takes into account all of these moving parts in this structure. Those that do it, the VCs can see right through it. They will know exactly who knows their shit versus those who don't. And those that can differentiate themselves, they usually are the leaders of the pack. They get the funds that they need and they're able to grow and execute their companies and be more successful than those that don't. Um, business Canvas frameworks are used to illustrate our uh, business model. So Pay attention to this because we're going to be working with this model today. And um, it's a, just a simple one pager. I really like it. Uh, and we're not going to ask you to put together a business model as you would in a pitch presentation where you're presenting it. But before you do that, you need to start somewhere. And typically we start using these kinds of tools, like these Canvas tools. This Canvas tool, uh, allows you to scribe in your key partners, um, your value proposition, uh, customer relationships, customer segments, your distribution channels, key resources, the cost of your, of your model, and the different revenue streams um, within your model. Now, all of you might not have this thinking flushed out, but for today, it's a good starting point. We're going to noodle with this template today, so you get a feel at least of what it's like to start thinking along these lines and start building out the preliminary thinking of a business uh, of a of a business model. I don't expect you to get it right. You're not going to be judged on getting it right or not, but you're, we're just going to have a little bit of fun today working with this because it's critical. And for those of you that are eventually going to tell your story or pitch your story to either a business partner or to a VC to raise funds, and you're going to have to present the thinking and articulate the business model, you can't do it without having some kind of a background like this. That's why you're going to get some hands-on experience with this today. Um, it's also important to differentiate business model versus revenue model and a revenue stream. Okay, so quite often I see some, I've seen in some presentations where they confuse these. Someone might have a title, here's our revenue model, and they're presenting all aspects of a business model or vice versa. So a business model is the structure comprised of all aspects of a company, including your revenue model and revenue streams, and it describes how they all work together. The revenue stream is a company's single source of revenue, and a company can have one or multiple revenue streams. So you could sell maybe equipment, but you may also provide a service that might complement uh, that equipment for, for your, your customer. And a revenue model is the strategy of managing a company's revenue streams and the resources required for each revenue stream. All right. Um, and once again, we're going to look at a few examples of uh, business models, but this is just a reminder of all the mega trends in the health sector that's driving change uh, with the business model. This was put together nicely by Ernst & Young. Um, we have uh, an evolving uh, customer landscape, right? Pricing and cost pressures to bring costs down. Um, there's competition and commoditization. There's the care transformation and innovation, again, going from treatment to prevention and going from inpatient to outpatient. We have the technology advancements that is actually helping us achieve that as well. Supply chain disruptions uh, and uh, changing regulatory environment. And when you choose your business model, in addition to using a business canvas model, I think it's also good to illustrate uh, uh, in, in any uh, strategic plan or uh, pitch presentation, an illustration of your model. And some of you are, are familiar with some of these. We have the, uh, the freemium model where you may provide a product 
free of charge to an organization, but you'll charge some kind of subscription fees in order to use that product. Um, there is the, uh, the ad-based model. I saw a pitch presentation two weeks ago of a new telehealth platform uh, that is um, being launched for physician use as well as the pharmaceutical industry. And the, uh, the payment mechanism for this for the developer is largely ads, very similar to what you see there. And we also have product service models as well. We don't have time to go through all of these, but the point of generating good illustrations and using a good um, uh, template like that Canvas model can help you get miles ahead in preparing your thinking around your business model and how you want to convey that model to your various stakeholders. Uh, okay. So, and again, these are the changing forces that are fueling new business models in healthcare. We got shifting market dynamics, regulatory changes, healthcare transformation, value-based care, and technology evolution. What I want to show you is actually how these are changing the, uh, the, uh, the marketplace. So the shifting market dynamics with these rising costs that we're facing and, and the cost pressures in the healthcare system, it's creating what are called accountable care organizations. There's another acronym you've got to learn, an AOC, sorry, an ACO. And these are networks and they enable coordinated care and, and this drives down prices as a result of increased bargaining power. Um, you have regulatory and reimbursement changes, right? New telehealth and digital medical device reimbursement pathways. Uh, this is creating new incentives for technological development and sector partnerships. In fact, regulatory and reimbursement changes in telehealth is creating a huge partnership dynamic. We're going to show some examples of that later today's presentation. We got healthcare transformation, moving care away from hospitals, shifting towards preventative and virtual care. What this has done, though, it's disrupted the entire in-person delivery. And a lot of these reimbursement mechanisms were payment mechanisms were based on in-person delivery. So um, it, it, it's, it's imperative that um, you tune in to all of the changes of how payments are made in, in this industry so that you can find the right solution for your innovation in the context of this shifting paradigm that we're seeing. Technological evolution, right? Med tech, uh, digital um, uh, therapy, uh, SAMD, that's software medical devices. Uh, this is an entity and it's uh, also defined by the FDA. And uh, as well as the Internet of Medical Things and AI, it's changing the whole care delivery and workflows across the board. And then there's value-based care, the move away from a fee-for-service uh, we're going to look at a few companies that have created um, very unique payment structures on value. So one of these is a Medtronic, and I'll later show you that they struck a deal with um, a number of different payers where if their technology fails to produce the outcomes, that they will actually pay the buyer. That's money flowing the other way. We never saw that in the past. So this is just an amazing, uh, it's amazing. I think how this whole COVID environment has created a catalyst event for these major changes in partnership thinking as well as uh, uh, payer thinking as well. Question. Yeah, you know, you're right. There, there's the evolving trends are not perfect, but I think they're headed in the right direction. So, and yeah, there may be what we call in quotations some side effects with these changes in thinking. Um, and we, you know, but, but we, I think we are moving down the right path. And, uh, the idea with, um, putting a value based care is, Getting a good bang for the buck um, that is reasonable and that is acceptable and that is affordable rather than just setting a price 
that's just not attainable by the patient and will not be reimbursed by payers, which creates a bottlenecks in our healthcare system. So um, really good question. I don't have the answer, but I think, or the best answer is we, we are at least shifting our thinking and the paradigm is moving in that direction and we're getting better and better and better at it. Yeah, well, it's becoming more usual. I'm going to show you. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's now talk, we're going to look at some examples of companies that have demonstrated um, kind of innovative ways of collecting their money for their innovations and, um, and how payers are also paying those organizations. And then later, we're going to look at some examples of unique partnerships that are going out there. And look, when you're looking at these, just be aware of th these are the possibilities of what you can or maybe cannot do. And um, the point of this is to also get your minds going to start thinking about your product as you kind of see here what very successful organizations have done with their products. So um, I know by entering um, these new payment models also largely benefit, I think, providers and payers, uh, but it's taking the risk from the providers and payers and it's putting it back to the organizations selling those, those products. Um, and by entering into contracts with med tech companies, providers and payers can shift those risks, their financial risks, as they try to demonstrate evidence-based improved patient outcomes. And that puts a huge risk on the manufacturer as well. And we can see though that there's improved care quality and enhanced patient experiences through these new incentives because there are quite a few success stories. Um, although uh, it's, it's not uncomplex to establish these kinds of uh, programs. So Medtronic is, uh, they adopted a risk sharing approach. Uh, they signed a contract with over a thousand hospitals. Um, I think the, thousand hospitals gave them access to uh, millions of patients, actually. Um, they developed what's called the uh, TYRX cardiac. This is designed to help lower infection and mortality rates to reduce associated cost of care expenses. And if their product fails to prevent infection, they have to reimburse the hospital for a portion of those expenses. Again, we never saw that before, but I think this is an example where a company is so confident with their outcomes data, right? Perhaps through the, the outcomes based on their clinical trials that uh, they feel that, hey, we can, we believe in our product. In fact, we're willing to cost share in a following way. And this is just an example of how they did it. Um, I think the uh, proof in the pudding though will be a few years later, uh, just to see uh, what the outcomes of this over time. But I, I, increasingly, you're going to see more and more of these kinds of models. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is real. Oh, I don't have the data behind this, but I am aware that they structured these kinds of deals there. Yeah. Question? Oh, yeah. You, you, okay. So yeah, great question. So I guess I have not seen the wording of the agreement, so I can't answer that question. But those are the kinds of dialogue that you have when you're sitting with the payers. Uh, uh, this is part of reimbursement planning. And that's why we also, it's critically important to model um, in your clinical program. If you're required to do a clinical trial, it's really important to get health economic outcomes thinking into the trial design so that you can try to get certain um, measures and, uh, and outcomes that plays into your value story. For those companies that think ahead, they think smart, and they can collect that data, then you can use that data to sit down to negotiate certain cost structure or payment structure on your innovation based on 
um, good data sources that you have so they know the risks that they're taking because they have the data around it. For those companies that don't invest in good health economic outcome thinking in their clinical programs, they're carrying huge risks because they don't, they may not be able to know the proportion of patients that are benefiting or not benefiting from the technology, right? And then if you're going into some kind of a risk sharing um, uh, agreement, it, it, it could be very challenging. Um, this is a, I like this table. So what this table shows you are more examples of payment models in the med tech with risk sharing. And uh, it's structured uh, into two different categories. So at the top is what we call the outcome guarantee model. That's the Medtronic example we just saw. This is where manufacturers give providers large discounts or rebates if certain clinical economic outcomes are not met, right? That's what we just saw. There are other uh, risk sharing models. On the bottom is called the gain sharing models. This is where manufacturers provide products at a low price, but providers and payers agree to share with the manufacturers a portion of the cost savings revenue gains from the use of those products. So, for example, if a product may shorten your hospital stay by X number of days, and then that creates a certain cost savings per patient times so many patients over a certain period of time, there will be a certain kickback to the organization from those cost savings. And look, we don't have enough time to go through all these examples, but I've structured these slides so you can go back into them and see all the different examples that we see here. Um, there's another, so Medtronic had a deal here with Aetna uh, uh, Insurance Company, and it's a partnership very similar of um, uh, getting payment for certain efficiencies that are achieved by Aetna insurance companies. There's also payment models without risk sharing. So um, here on the top, there's the device as a service model. These are where providers uh, contract to access technologies instead of owning them. So it's like a leasing type of an agreement. And then there's what's called your management service model where providers outsource the management and operations of a lab or a clinic to a med tech company. So um, these are good tables for you to follow because uh, many of you may be working on different products, but those products might align along the thinking of some of the companies that you see here, and you might wanna borrow or steal some of these ideas or build on them, or perhaps evolve them and create a new category on its own for, for your, your product and company. Um, but importance of partnerships, uh, I'm going to share with you some trends that we're seeing in partnerships that are really cool. Um, and we're going to look at it across these four categories, digital health providers with large scale employers, digital health platforms and clinical practices, medical device manufacturers and data management platforms, and pharma acquiring digital health uh, startup companies. So let's look at the first one. Uh, these are the first one is the digital health providers with large scale uh, employers. So the one example that really stands out is called Calm. Has anyone heard of Calm before? Right. The number one app for sleep and meditation. And this company has developed a deal with 1500 organizations, uh, including some major organizations in the U.S., Universal Music Group and Kraft Heinz, they've adopted this platform. And um, everybody benefits. It's a win-win-win. Um, Calm has access to millions more users with this uh, system. Employers have a cost-effective way to improve employee mental health and reduce burnout, leading to potential uh, what was called knock-on effects, including less absenteeism and increased presenteeism, and it's just great for patients because we need to do better at addressing mental health, right? We're just so far behind where we need to be in our society, and uh, this is a win-win-win. Great to see. Um, there's also digital health platforms. There's a few more examples here. There's a company called Headspace, and they uh, act as an early stage indicator for people with mental health issues and they have partnerships and practices with mental health practices and health networks. 
such as Solera Health, um, and it allows them to qualify, screen, and direct prospective candidates to mental health care providers. And this has been one of the major gaps in our society to help people with mental health issues, and they're trying to address some of the major gaps that we have. So these providers pay Headspace a fee per each patient they receive, adding to its subscription what's called B2B revenue, and Solera, Solera receives more distribution channels for its services. So just two examples how two companies can come together and um, uh, uh, build a, a business model that allows them both to catapult their business to entire other level. Great to see. And you're going to be seeing more and more and more of these kinds of uh, partnerships. I think you're going to see a lot more medical device manufacturers and data management platforms. So here's one example. Uh, it's a Dexcom working with a company called Gluco, right, uh, for several years, and they jointly develop digital health solutions for people with diabetes. So uh, Dexcom has the hardware and uh, the diabetes knowledge, and Gluco's platform, the, they have the platform and the analytics expertise through data sharing agreement. And these are how two companies came together um, to uh, enable providers to make fast and more informed clinical decisions. Great to see for um, diabetes. I'm just going to skip this. Um, well, no, actually, let me back up for a moment. Also, we're seeing more partnering with pharmaceutical companies and uh, digital therapeutics, a major change. I've seen pharma companies working with digital therapeutics and AI companies as well to try to find out ways how they can improve their manufacturing and reduce the costs associated with it, because I showed you earlier major concerns with, um, with uh, profit around R&D. And uh, we're, we're just seeing deals being signed everywhere. Here, Sanofi signed a $30 million deal um, with Dario Health, uh, a digital health company, to develop solutions to expand its reach into health plan and employer markets. And uh, you had a question, sorry? Absolutely. Yeah. It's there, there as well. No, a absolutely. There's another company called Propeller Health. Propeller Health, uh, they develop sensors that go into puffers and inhalers. And they struck a deal with almost every manufacturer of an inhaler where you could use these centers and monitor patient usage and health uh, and, and dosing in real time. We never saw that before. You usually get a script. You go and you try it. You come back and you have a dialogue with your physician. And now managed care teams can follow uh, your um, your dosing on the cloud. Um, what, what a great way for real time medical care, um, particularly if you have major issues like asthma, serious asthma patients. So um, we're just seeing an incredible amount of partnerships between pharmaceutical companies and digital health companies. And these are just a few of the examples that we're seeing here. So look, in summary, companies are moving quickly, right, to develop strategic capabilities for these new business arrangements. Um, the current market I think presents really major, um, uh, uh, the current market presents healthcare organizations with an array of opportunities. So we just talked about a lot of the, the downside of all the market pressures and how it has uh, put a lot of pressure on medical device companies as well as the pharma market, but it's also equally created a lot of opportunities of how you can differentiate yourself in your thinking and um, particularly around how you can uh, build a business model, whether through partnerships or innovative payment mechanisms that can turn heads in this industry. Uh, it, so it's not just about how good your product is and what it can do, but it's how you can bring that product to the bedside with unique payment mechanisms and through unique partnerships that can help you take your market share to a level that you never thought you could imagine. Uh, by doing it smartly. And those that 
do this in a, in a really smart way. They're the ones that catch the attention of the VC because it's not just about your product. It's about your management team, how they think and how you're working with partners and how you're thinking through novel payer solutions, which you have to in, in today's market. Again, those that do it well, they succeed. Those that don't, they, they really do struggle and they will struggle. Um, so where do you start? Here's just a little bit of advice. Uh, begin your journey maybe with these considerations, right? Define the business case and the partnership model up front. Um, if there are partners that are suitable for your type of innovation, um, uh, explore who to partner with. Uh, if you are going to work with a partner, what goals are you solving? What goals are they trying to solve? And can you align these goals together or are they synergistic? Um, Try to understand what services to offer, if you can offer services in addition to your um, uh, your products that you may be selling, and ensure you have your technology ready and that it's in place, particularly with your when you're engaging with VCs. Uh, and and starting with a business model framework like this, I, I think, is a really good starting point. So that summarizes a little bit our thinking around business modeling, and I think. What this session may have done is just maybe opened your thinking a little bit more about what all the possibilities could be. That's what's more important rather than me teaching you what, how each model is structured. Um, again, it is a structure with all of those elements that are required in that business canvas model and all of those elements coming together forms the preliminary thinking of your business model. It's straightforward. It's quite simple. But it's a complex market and you got to find unique solutions to navigate in this complex market and to differentiate yourself. Okay. Sorry, I missed the first part. Can you repeat that once more, please? Yes. Yes. Uh, you, you know, it it it, it depends on. Um, I think you need to model how many times they're going to use it throughout the entire year, and it's a modeling exercise. And I think you need to do a whole bunch of case scenarios to make sure you get it right. I, in fact, um, I was the former CEO and I'm current chairman of the board of uh, an organization called Coal, Coal Block Technologies. We manufacture laboratory instruments. We did have dialogue with many um, of our commercial laboratories of putting a time clock um, that we can monitor uh, in our instruments. So when they put it on in a lab inside a fume hood, um, we charge them for a certain amount of time of usage. Um, now there are pros and cons with those kinds of models. And uh, you, you need to examine all of those pros and cons, but it, it could benefit both parties. If you don't structure it properly, it could benefit one over the other. Really good question. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we're gonna we're just just a few minutes behind, but I'm gonna make up for it. Let me just spend five to ten minutes with you on financials because it's really important. So. Uh, the VCs, again, maybe of those, all those items is if you show up with a strong management team, you know your stuff, um, you have a good business model thinking that's going to turn some heads. And number three, you also build in a competency, show good competency for financial management. Your financials may suck. Okay. They may be awful. But it's how you're working with them. So for a lot of cash strap companies, the financial picture is not very good. It doesn't look good. But what you can show is, for example, I was able to deliver these milestones with this amount of cash, or this is how we're managing what we call our cash runway. For those companies that better do that, um, it really attracts the VC because they want to work with organizations that have a good sense of financial management 
and sometimes even dealing with very difficult um, situations. Um, I've seen companies in very difficult financial, uh, have a difficult financial picture, but they have fared better with VCs than companies that have a rosy picture, just because they have showed how they're managing that difficult picture um, much better than the other company. Okay, a little bit on financials. Should every pitch deck include financials? The answer is yes. And they must be customized by on the maturity of the of the startup. It depends on where you are and what kind of financials you're going to show. Um, there was a, a survey where we asked 25 investment experts what realistic financial slides, what do they look like? They just said use charts and graphs, make it realistic and accurate, show data over time, and these slides must succinctly outline the financial health of your company while projecting revenue um, uh, potential in the future. Okay, so we don't have time to go through each and every one of these financial slides, but what I'm going to leave you with is you can go back and and use this as a as a as a resource, and uh, uh, we are providing you with examples of pitch decks that might summarize um, your fundraise, uh, your, your 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 fundraise. We have uh, pitch decks that address profit. Uh, we have uh, pitch decks that look at growth um, and um, metrics that look at even the break-even rate of organizations. There's so many different ways of doing it. We're going to leave all of these uh, with you. But there are three key reminders that I want you to be aware of for the slides. Okay, number one is... Uh, Use good graphs and illustrations. Um, number one, show trends um, and show good labeling as well. But this is one of my go-to slides that I like the most. And you can do this either on a chart or you can show both chart and, and graphs. Why do I like this one? Because it shows you quite a few important metrics that all VCs want to look at. Number one is kind of your income statement. Right, your profit and loss or your PL. They like to see your headcount projections. They want to see how much cash you have on hand and they want to see your multiple year revenue projections. That this slide is really simple. It shows you at the top, right? You can do it on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, or you can present it on an annual basis, year one, two, three, four. And these are all the important items. You can also show it in a good bar graph as well, like this, where you show both the table and you show the bar graphs or the combination of both. And don't forget to include your break-even year. It's really important to know because a lot of these VCs at this time, they want a quick win. They don't want to wait too long to uh, realize um, the, the uh, uh, to exit a, an organization. So if you can demonstrate a break-even earlier then organizations that are demonstrating it later, I think it puts you in a more favorable position. Question? Yeah. Yes. Well, a real world example, when I was pitching to VCs in 2018, you know, we had a, a five year exit. I can tell you that COVID put us back three years. And um, so, uh, but I have a reasonable explanation and they all bought into it and they all understand it. They're not happy, but it happened. And uh, so, yeah, there are a lot of things that you may not necessarily see into the future that can change um, what your uh, what your assumptions were, right? And uh, and uh, you know, looking back now, would I have done it any differently? No, no, I wouldn't at all. Those were the assumptions and the projections that we made with the best in, uh, information that we had on hand. But these slides allows you at least to articulate the, those those facts, and at least it 
helps the VC understand why you're projecting your, your financials in the way that you are, gives them the opportunity to ask you some good questions, and for the management team to show up and to explain why they're thinking the way that they're thinking. And again, it just helps you um, differentiate yourself quite substantially. Okay. 